All right, so welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to have you joining us. Thank you for filling out the poll. I love it. Stephanie, can you see the poll questions by chance? Yes, yes. and I see the questions, uh, the answers coming in. I see the bars moving. <laughs> so fun. Yeah. We'll reveal the results in just a moment, just waiting for a few more people to join. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. And I love how um, modest some of the gardeners are. I know that you all know more than you think you know, but I do appreciate, um, you know, the, the everyone being so humble. But yeah, it's gardening is a forever learning experience. We are always learning more. It's something that we never stop learning about. And I am so excited to for this program. This is one of my most favorite programs to teach. It is very, uh, it's very inspiring. We all, uh, I will uh, guarantee that you're gonna want to get straight out into your gardens right after this program to go look for um, good bugs in the garden. All right, let's give everyone another minute. I'm surprised so many people are really interested in um, learning about spiders because that's typically the one that doesn't get any attention because, you know, so many people are freaked out by them. And Which soldier is soldier beetles too. I only just yeah. learned about soldier beetles. Very good. Soldier beetles are great. Yeah, they're neck and neck, spiders and soldier beetles. <laughs> yeah, we'll tell you that. But you'll see everything in a moment. <laughs> I guess ladybugs, not surprisingly, are top Number of what, Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. Anybody else want to um, fill out the polling questions? We'll give you one last chance. And all right, I'm going to end the poll. So let me share the results. How fun is that? So um, we really are, I'd say it's very balanced, believe it or not, when it comes to the level of experience in the gardening. So we, you know, over half are going to be uh, fairly established, confident gardeners. And then we've got a nice selection of newbies and then a handful of experienced gardeners that are green thumbs. And then I see definitely ladybugs take the win. And then, um, it is not surprising that the majority of you are not familiar with the Our Water, Our World program, but here we are to, uh, we're going to share about that right now. So, uh -oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. Did I um, lose my screen? No, no, it's all there. You just may want to close the poll. Yeah. You're seeing the results yeah. right now. Great, great. Okay, super. All right, so let's get started. Um, Right, just want to welcome everyone for joining us. I am um, here tonight with, or this afternoon with Stephanie from, um, who's assisting me with the Alameda Clean Water, uh, Clean Water uh, program this evening, uh, Gardening for the Good Bugs. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through slides for about 45 minutes. It's a lot of content. I have a lot of really fun information. So it tends to be a little bit longer, but I will try to really uh, keep it, um, um, you know, at the time. And then I'll save time for you all for questions at the end. And please feel free to go ahead and um, you can just go ahead and enter your questions in the chat if that's more comfortable. Um, you know, we can just leave the chat as the main way of communicating. However, if you end up entering a question in the Q&A, that's fine too. And so what we're going to learn this afternoon is who many of the common good bugs are and how they're helping us and how to keep them around. 
So I want to start since the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program is our sponsor this afternoon, I'd like to share that they uh, really do a lot of amazing work to help protect the Alameda County uh, creeks, wetlands, and bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. Related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden areas into the storm drain by irrigation and rains. Um, so what I'd like to share is that understand that um, here in the Bay Area, we receive uh, about half of the water that falls on California and in snowpack, the snowpack, we get uh, of all the watersheds, we get about half of that water that and finds its way into the Bay Area. And along the way, it's picking up um, any type of like chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, debris, litter, pet waste, motor oil, um, and it's carrying it with it into the waterways and eventually to the bay. And then how that relates to our garden is that around our garden, if we are using any products that aren't plant-based or biodegradable, that includes fertilizers and pesticides, we, um, it's inevitable that they can find their way into the storm drain that goes straight out to the bay with a lot of ease. So uh, as well as using products inside the house where they will um, end up into the sewer system, but at the sewer treatment facilities, they're not quite sophisticated enough to um, extract all of the chemicals and pollutants such as pesticides. So understand when we are using products in the house, again, that are not plant-based or biodegradable, um, they are inevitably very easily able to find their ways into uh, the sewer system and not uh, cleaned or extracted, and then again, finding their ways to the waterways. So if you'd like to learn more about the clean water news, there's this really great newsletter that you can sign up for that will keep you up to speed on events and programs and how you can get more involved in your community and so forth. Um, Stephanie, did you wanna add anything more to that? Well, the, the e-news will also inform you about the upcoming webinars that we have in this series. So wanna definitely sign up and the recording will be on the YouTube channel afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the Our Water, Our World program is a program that's designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality and help you make better choices when it does, when it does come to gardening, to fertilizing, and specifically pest management. So you might see or notice our materials in a lot of the retailers around the county where we have fact sheets that uh, will address certain pest problems and offer less toxic pest management, as well as noticing these little blue tags that will that identify products that are less toxic. And so with that, you can make safer choices that are not going to be as toxic to your home, to your garden, to our environment, and specifically not to the waterways. And we are an IPM educational program. We partner with uh, water pollution prevention agencies and local retail stores. And because we're an IPM um, educational program, I like to share a little bit about what that is. It's integrated pest management. And it is a, uh, uh, a decision-making process that uses science-based strategies. So this is all science-based pest problem solving. And um, IPM allows us to look at the system as a whole. In this case, it'll be the garden. And when we can look at uh, the garden and see problems through the lens of IPM, we're actually able to identify the problem more uh, precisely as opposed to uh, recognizing maybe the symptoms of that problem. And then from there, it helps us to identify that problem and then solve that problem for long-term results. And sometimes we ask ourselves, well, is this a problem that we can live with? Uh, is it a situation like the spittle bugs that come in the uh, middle to end of March and we know they're very short term and I really have nothing, you know, they don't really pose any threat to my plants. Maybe I don't need to take any action, but maybe it's something where I do need to take some action, like maybe ants coming into the house. And so from there, we look at a combination of what they're uh, of actions and those are called controls. So cultural controls is bolstering the health of the environment. So maybe with the case of the ants coming in, we're gonna plug those holes with the fresh feet of caulk to prevent them from coming in. 
Um, and uh, or in the garden, uh, increasing the health of the garden with compost and mulch and so forth. Mechanical controls would be tools we use to manage pest problems like gopher baskets or fencing, uh, maybe sticky traps or uh, yellow jacket traps and so forth. Biological controls is using living organisms to manage the pests. And that's really what we're uh, talking about this afternoon. And then of course, chemical controls, these are the pesticides. We're really going to use these as a last resort. Uh, typically after we've done all these others, we don't really, uh, oftentimes we don't need to go for the pesticide. We've solved the problem. But if we do, then we will um, be very uh, mindful that we're gonna use an eco-friendly product. And if it's a plant that's always struggled, it's never performed the way we expected it to, please give yourself permission just to remove that plant and replace it with something that's going to thrive and uh, really perform much better for you. So how does IPM relate to this program? Well, let's look at IPM for beneficial insects. So identification is the key. And then we want to set our gardens up for success. And we want to grow biodiversity. And then we want to reduce and eliminate pesticide usage. And this does include our eco-friendlies. And I'll explain more why later. So I want to start. I've prepared a really fun game for everyone. I'm going to test your knowledge. It is short, so don't get too stressed. I know sometimes a, a game can be a little stressful, but first I'd like everyone to identify. Please find that you can raise your hand. It should be on the bottom of the screen between chat and Q&A. Okay, great. Everyone can raise their hand right on. Okay, I love it. So, okay, I hope everyone's ready because this is really a lot of fun for me. So I hope it's a lot of fun for you. So let's get started. All right, you see this critter in the garden. Are we gonna squish it or not? If we're gonna squish it, raise your hand. Raise your hand if we're gonna squish this one. I know. Yeah, it's really freaky looking, huh? I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. Yeah, anybody else wanna squish this one? Because I know that I would squish it. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, oh my gosh, we see this creepy crawler with these piercing mouth parts and these spikes. Are we gonna squish it? Raise your hand if we're gonna squish it. Yeah, that's what Whoa, I'm talking about. Ten five. Oh my God, this freaks people out. <laughs> yeah, how fun is that? All right, yeah, this one is creepy looking. I sure as heck would squish it. All right, we ready for the next one? Uh, <laughs> it is so weird looking. How many of us would squish it? Hmm. A lot of people. Yeah, I don't really like these kind of slimy things. All right, we ready for the next one? All right, look at this crazy alien. Are we gonna squish it? Cause I'm pretty sure I know what it is and I would definitely squish this one. Yeah, on that one I had to raise my hand but I'm yeah. unsure. <laughs> right on. Okay, how fun. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, we still have people coming in with this. Okay, fun. All righty. Oh yeah. That I think got the most raised hands. All right. Oh, we still got a couple more. I love it. <laughs> yeah, every Allison just shared, she doesn't want to squish anything because she doesn't want to touch these crazy looking yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's why you wear your gloves, right? Oh my God, I love it. Okay, well, guess what? They were all beneficial insects. Isn't that wild? Crazy. Oh, here, let's, let's meet our friends, okay? I'm really excited to introduce you. So we all know about this one. This is our lady beetle, AKA ladybug. Uh, I like to share that we have over 450 species of ladybugs in North America. That is a lot. They're going to vary in color. So uh, they're always going to be the same shape. 
Uh, they're always, they're all going to be about the same size, uh, rather small, um, but they could be all orange or all red, or they could be gray with black spots or uh, all black with two red spots. Uh, sometimes they're just going to uh, have a all you know that's orangish red with just a couple spots sometimes with a lot of spots so a lot of different ways they come however the one way they do not come is green uh, green with black spots is a different insect which we'll share in a bit um, ladybugs are going to be cruising around eating nectar from plants but also eating insects throughout their lifespan they can eat over 5,000 uh, aphids and other insects such as scale insects spider mites and other insect eggs so they do a tremendous job keeping pest insects in balance um, what I can share is that they love the California native buckwheat. So if we have buckwheat planted in our garden, they are really going to be attracted to that. They're going to stick around. They really love it. Um, but something I can share is that uh, it's really nice to create habitat for our ladybugs. And that's going to take a little bit more than just flowers. Typically, uh, what we want to do is maybe have a combination of different types of flowers, uh, uh, perennials, small and medium sized shrubs, as well as trees. And then what we're going to do is create more habitat and places for them to nest and hide, which looks like maybe some areas of the garden with a chunkier arbor mulch, or maybe from that medium sized or large shrub or small tree, we've cut some branches that are not any bigger than your forearm that we can maybe lay around maybe along the side of a path. And what happens is, is that the lady beetles will uh, nest in these areas and take shelter in these areas, which is kind of nice. And so this, my friends, is the larva. This is the teenager of the lady beetle. And uh, these little uh, critters look like tiny little miniature alligators. And they're also going to vary in color as the adults do. So this one happens to be a very dark charcoal gray with these black kind of um, specks on it, which are actually little furry parts. And then there's like orangish blotches, but sometimes they're gonna have stripes. Sometimes they're going to be uh, black with gray stripes or gray blotches or, um, or they can be uh, a little bit all black or maybe all black with just some red stripes. So always a little different, but the thing, the primary, uh, what we're looking at, it's primarily black and it's going to be pretty tiny, usually about a quarter of an inch to just under half of an inch. And they are going to be feeding strictly on insects during their two to four week life cycle in this phase. And then they're going to pupate. Uh, so during that two to four weeks, they are just out there devouring insects and it is a lot of fun. Um, they can consume hundreds, hundreds of aphids and other insects, as I mentioned, the scale insects, spider mites and insects and eggs during this time. So they are doing an amazing job just cruising around and eating. I call them like they have teenage appetites. All I wanna do is just consume. And so this is the lady beetle pupa. So after the ladybug larva, and you can see that arrow up at the top, it's the larva starting to uh, transform into the pupa. They look like these little dome shapes. They kind of look strange. And so what's going to happen is that they're going to be in this phase for anywhere from like five to 15 days. So you'll see them on leaves, or in this case, it's a bamboo stake in my garden. And that's pretty thick bamboo stake. It's about two inches in diameter. And uh, or like the side of a fence or raised bed or pottery. I've seen them on the side of my pots. Uh, so I just like to check them out. And actually, I have to be honest, I go out every day to see if they have emerged as an adult beetle. It's a lot of fun. And then this 
These are the ladybug eggs. So uh, what you're going to see is that underneath leaves early in the spring, you'll start to see these little clusters of anywhere five to 30. Uh, they're little golden yellow, almost like footballs that are up on their points. And uh, they actually will emerge as a larva which in, within two to five days. So this is a lot of fun. Let me tell you, when I uh, start to do my late winter, early spring pruning, I have to say I'm always on the lookout because they are oftentimes on those plants that are starting to be uh, overrun by aphids because if we've got aphids, guess what? They're going to come and the lady beetles are going to lay their eggs near aphid infestations and then we don't need to use any pesticides, but they need to have food. So we need to have some aphids in our garden. All right. This is are green lacewing. So we recognize the green lacewing as fluttering around the porch light at night. It is always a treat when we see or when I see a green lacewing fluttering around my garden. They are nectar feeders. So uh, I will share that this one was enjoying some nectar from one of my daffodils at the end of spring. They are strictly going to be out there and enjoying nectar, pollen, and other um, you know, the honeydew, the sugary substance that a lot of the pest insects secrete, such as the aphids, they will feed off of this. So uh, it is always a treat to see them in the garden. They will stay and live as their whole life cycle will be anywhere from two, I'm um, sorry, four to six weeks, depending on the season. Um, you know, if the summer or the warmer temperatures, their season, their lifespan will be a little longer than if it's getting colder, but they have a very short lifespan of just two to, I'm sorry, four to six weeks. And then this creepy crawler that we all wanted to squish is, oops, sorry is the uh, lady, the lacewing larva. So this um, critter is very, very tiny. He's really going to be about a quarter of an inch. And I understand they can grow up to half an inch, but I've never seen them that large. Uh, they are really tiny and you almost think you can't see them, but they are so recognizable because they always look exactly like this. They are tiny and they are brown and they have these spikes and these piercing mouth parts. And this guy's nickname is aphid lion. He is on the hunt, can consume insects at the rate of one per minute. And he is going to be out there looking for aphids and, um, uh, scale insects, small caterpillars, other insect lay eggs. They, he's just got a, just a raging carnivorous appetite just on the hunt. And let me share this fun story. When I was doing research for this program years ago, I came upon a university paper that was studying the lacewing larva and noted that they um, experienced that they would come in, that this guy would come in and hollow out an aphid, take that outer shell, so to speak, the outer body of the aphid, throw it on its back as camouflage to go in to eat more aphids. Can you believe that? They are so smart. It's remarkable. So hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of uh, insects um, and they are going to be in this stage for uh, two to three weeks. So the longest period of their lifespan is really as a larva just out there eating uh, before they will transition to be the uh, adult. And then this is super cool. Check this out. These are lacewing eggs. So again, if you ever have an infestation of aphids, take a closer look. It is so fun to discover lacewing eggs. Now, this is a trip. They're always going to be this kind of creamy ivory color up to maybe a limey green or a pale green. They're always going to be very, very tiny and they're always going to be on the stalk that's about a quarter of an inch long. And the reason why the adult lays eggs on the stalk is because when that egg hatches, that larva has such an incredible appetite, it would eat all of the other eggs if they were lined up in the same fashion as those um, lady beetle eggs. So they're going to hatch, they're going to be on the hunt, and they are going to uh, want to devour insects, uh, pest insects. So what is their favorite? Let me show you another picture. Here they are with the all black lady 
beetle larva. And here's another um, egg. So sadly, when that egg hatches, those uh, aphids are going to be gone because these ladybugs, the larva is already, they're already devouring them. But anyway, but the way we attract the lacewings is by planting flowers that are in like the carrot or aster family. So flowers that um, of course look like asters, uh, anything that might look like a sunflower, um, a small daisy uh, aster like in my picture here, or things in the carrot family. I like to let my dill go to flower, parsley, um, even cilantro, things that are clusters of little flowers are also going to be very inviting for the lacewing. And if you have an infestation of aphids or other uh, pests like that, uh, and you are just worried, like you don't see any beneficial insects and you're not uh, using pesticides, you can start by mixing a combination of a tablespoon of sugar with one cup of water and spray that around where the aphid infestation is. The lady beetles and the lacewings are attracted to that sugar and they will come and once they see that they have a, a nice population of aphids for their young to consume, they'll lay their eggs and they will take care of the problem for you. All right. This is one of my most favorite little friends in the garden. This is the surfid fly or hoverfly. Uh, I recently learned that we've got over 600 species of these in North America. Another name they go by is flower fly. So I've been asked all, all spring, uh, I've got all these little flies uh, around my flowers. I don't know what they are, or they look like they could be gnats or something. Well, let me tell you, these guys can be very, very tiny, all the way up to about a half an inch. So less than a quarter of an inch, all the way up to a half an inch in size. And they are a true fly. They just have two wings, not four like a bee. So they are disguised to look like a wasp or a bee because uh, they know that they could be prey to birds and other um, uh, things that would like to eat them. So that's why you'll always see them with these stripes, but they do not have stingers. They do not want to swarm you. They do not want anything to do with you. All they want to do is pollinate the flowers and they are very important. They are really wonderful. You might recognize them in the garden as that one little uh, guy that like hovers and he darts around like a helicopter and then it'll come over here and stop and hover. That's where they get the name hoverfly. Uh, so they're really fun. I have lots in my garden. I'm always thrilled to see them. Now this weirdo that everyone wanted to smush is the hoverfly or surfed fly larva. Now, very tiny. You see them right there on that rosebud. So here's the deal. These, because that is a fly, this is a maggot that word we don't really like to use. It's kind of a caterpillar or like worm-like little organism. Let's just leave it at that. But he definitely has a stripe down his back. It is going to be the only little worm-like friend that has a racing stripe down his back. And they're going to range in like this limey green all the way to kind of a khaki brown to almost opaque. And they are, you know, sometimes I, I mean, I do see them on my roses and I absolutely love it. Um, in fact, I plant alyssum because their most favorite flower, the adult, is sweet alyssum. And I will plant sweet alyssum around my roses specifically just to attract the uh, adult. And um, I will tell you that they do look very similar to the um, rose slug. That is a... Um, Oh my gosh, I just slipped my mind. It's another uh, pest. It looks similar, but let me tell you that rose slug is going to be on the leaves, skeletonizing those leaves, but it does not have that stripe down its back. Okay, so that is the difference. So you can be sure to, uh, you know, squish that rose slug if you want, but take a closer look to confirm it is not our uh, serpent fly larva friend. And again, they are on the hunt looking for aphids and other soft bodied insects and do an amazing job. Here is another one. They are really going to be tiny, anywhere from an eighth of an inch all the way to a half an inch. They're much easier to recognize when they're a little long, larger, but I will share that I, um, 
I do have them and I did almost wipe one off the other day because it was so tiny and they are going to be enjoying not only aphids, but other scale insects, thrips and spider mites. So they are really wonderful. And that's why I love having them uh, attracting them to my uh, roses whenever possible, since roses are prone to all of those pests. And i um, not sure if I mentioned, but they'll eat hundreds hundreds during their lifespan. Now, these are the surfeit fly eggs. They're going to be laid individually, typically near an aphid infestation. And if you look a little closer, you see they're about the same size as an aphid. So very, very tiny. So next time you go for a pesticide, even insecticidal soap, take a closer look and see if we've got any eggs, okay? Because uh, we want to be sure we're not spraying anything and we want to make sure that we protect them because they're going to take care of our um, pests for us. And their whole life cycle is just going to be about two to four weeks. But beyond the sweet alyssum, you can plant other things. They love the, alys um, the yarrow, as in the first picture I showed you. They also love the California native buckwheats, the cilantro flowers. Let me share. I grow cilantro just for the flowers because when that cilantro is in flower, you will see it being swarmed by so many amazing beneficial insects. And that includes our serpent flies. Um, but really anything that has a lot of tiny flowers is going to be wonderful for our serpent fly friends. All right, now remember this one? This is the one everyone wanted to destroy. This is the mealybug destroyer. And I'm excited, especially because Stephanie just emailed me the other day saying she has some mealybugs in her garden. So I was so excited for her to be able to join this program. The mealybug destroyer is really cool. Uh, very tiny. The adult is a lady beetle. It's in the same family. And that lady beetle is always going to be all black with a red head. So it's always going to look the same. And it is tiny, 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 tiny. Uh, wait, I think it's a quarter of an inch. No, sixth of an inch, a sixth of an inch. And the larva is going to be a little larger, can grow up to a half of an, half of an inch. Now, here's the cool thing. The larva, uh, they're very fast. They have a short life of just a couple months. They're going to be cruising around just looking for insects. Their primary most favorite insect, of course, is the mealy bug. And uh, but they're also going to eat aphids and scale insects and thrips and other pests, which is wonderful. But the thing is, is because it looks so much like a mealy bug, it, it is not recognized and gets, um, sadly, uh, the bad news of a pesticide taking it out because of that. So understand that these guys are going to be twice the size of a mealybug. So when you have a mealybug infestation, take a close, closer look and see if you can recognize the mealybug destroyer. This is really fun because I finally got to see mealybug destroyers in really life in my garden. Here is ladybug larvae. See how big they are? And let's see, these guys just have two orange stripes. I was cutting down my fava beans, which I waited too long to cut down. They got infested with the black bean aphid. It was gross. But then I started to see the ladybug eggs. So I left them and then I'm cutting them down and I still see larva. And then in front of my eyes, I didn't believe it, but there is the, uh, the mealybug destroyer and I got so excited. So anyone that follows me on Instagram got to see how excited I got to see the mealybug destroyer in real, real life. Stephanie, please go out in your gardens and have a look. And I'm gonna check right after this webinar. <laughs> And it's so right. cool. They're very fast. They move. I feel like, I don't know the name of that dog breed, but have you seen the name that dog breed that is black that has like, uh, it's almost like dreadlocks. I feel like this moves a little bit like that. You don't see its face because these like white uh, fur or whatever it is kind of moves as it moves. So it's kind of fun. It's like felt. All right. So you can see, I get very excited about these insects. Um, all right. Quick interruption, Suzanne, because yeah. it's so exciting with your Instagram. Tell us your Instagram real quick. A few people want to know. Oh, it's at Plant Harmony. Plant Harmony. And it'll be on the last slide as well. Great, great. We'll go over all that. Okay, super. Thank you, everyone. All right. So this weirdo, has anyone seen this? This Sadly, this tomato hornworm thinks it's got a little, you know, bling. It's been bedazzled. But... <laughs> It's a parasitic wasp, and this is really 
interesting. So just keep an open mind. There is a whole world of parasitic wasps out there. And let me just check. We have, um, it's hundreds, several hundred species in North America. But here's the thing, what makes it a parasitic wasp is different than like a yellow jacket, really different. They spend part of their life in or on a host insect. So check this out. This is where they got the idea of that movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. So they will lay their eggs on their host, such as this tomato hornworm, or in such as an aphid or a leaf miner. And then when that uh, egg hatches, that larva will eat the inside of that insect and then emerge as an adult. So keep in mind, this freaks out a lot of people. These are not wasps, again, like I said, uh, where we would think of a yellow jacket. They do not have a stinger that wants to attack us or have anything to do with us. Because they're laying their eggs inside something as tiny as an aphid, these insects are minuscule, minuscule. We typically wouldn't even recognize them. They really look like they might be a fungus gnat flying around. And guess where they, I see them all the time is around my cilantro. I also have been seeing a lot of them around my euphorbia is in bloom. I have a very tiny flowering uh, euphorbia with tiny flowers. It is just so fun to see them swarming it. So when we've got, again, a lot of diversity in the garden, we're gonna see these guys. This is, really fun. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was working at a nursery. The manager brought this over to me. A customer came in, freaked out. This is their camellia leaves. They're like, what are all these crustaceans on my camellia leaves? Well, the manager knew I'd get really excited because he knew what it was. These are the aphid mummies. So when you see this, whenever we have an aphid infestation, take a closer look. If you see anything that looks like puffed rice uh, that has a perfectly cut out circle, that is an aphid that um, has been consumed by a parasitic wasp larva. So, and then that larva, when it wants to emerge as the adult parasitic wasp, it cuts a perfectly round circle to emerge. So when we see this type of activity, we know that we have parasitic wasps. We do not need to use pesticides. They do an amazing job at controlling leaf miners on both citrus and on our vegetables, things like that. Um, Psyllids, uh, aphids, heck, scale insects, leaf hoppers, caterpillars, cockroaches, flies, beetles, white flies, even ticks. It is a huge range. So that's when I say we've got hundreds of species. They're all doing something really important, keeping a lot of horrible pests in line. So isn't that a trip? All right, so let's check out our friend soldier beetle. Soldier beetle is going to be a little obvious. They're bigger. They're about a half an inch in size. They look uh, very similar to lightning bugs. They're in the same family. They're cousins, but the soldier beetle does not have that light producing organ. So they're cruising around. They're pollinating. They're also enjoying nectar. They're enjoying that honeydew substance that's secreted by insects like aphids and they're also eating some insects. So they're kind of doing all of the above, but what they're not doing is any damage to your plants. They are not doing any damage whatsoever. And sadly, they get mistaken as the culprit. So I have heard, and it's okay for all of you, there's no finger pointing, there's no shame. We all learn from our experiences. We may have killed this guy before and that's all right, because guess what? Now we know he's a good bug. So, um, I get these stories all the time, but he's out there. He's usually the first one to emerge in the spring on the hunt. And then the larva is going to also look very similar to an alligator. We hardly ever see him. It's gonna be a little larger, about three quarters of an inch. He, the larva is always going to be in the ground. And that larva is going to be consuming insects that are in the ground, such as uh, um, cricket eggs or um, uh, grasshopper eggs, things like that. They do a great job managing the insects in the ground as the soldier beetles do a great job managing the insects above ground. And then dragonflies. I just like to give the dragonflies a shout out because I feel like I have a tendency to kind of forget about them. I don't see them as often as I used to, but dragonflies are really, really important. Um, they are going to live in marshy areas, ponds, creeks. And we have so many of those around the county. That's why I just like to um, 
bring some awareness, just remind us that we have them. They start off as eggs that are as tiny as if you were just to draw a, just a dot with your ballpoint pen. And the eggs are typically scattered on the top of waterways in uh, like marshland vegetation or at the bottom of kind of a, a slightly wet or muddy creek bed. Once those eggs hatch, the larva, the nymphs of the dragonfly can live in the water anywhere from a few weeks to a couple of years. Because of this, they are very, very vulnerable to pesticides. So yet a whole nother reason why we want to avoid using pesticides that pose a threat to our water quality. But once they emerge as an adult, uh, they will have a fairly short lifespan. They're only living, I believe it's a couple of months. But during that time, they're eating hundreds, hundreds of flying insects like mosquitoes, fungus gnats, flies, anything that's a nuisance that flies around. They have this amazing legs that look like kind of a basketball hoop. And then they'll go around and kind of catch that insect and then pop it in their mouth like popcorn. They will hunt three mile radius from where they live. So from those marshlands, from those creeks, from those ponds, they are out hunting about three miles. They are doing an amazing job to help us out. All right. so. For those of you that are afraid of spiders, but it sounds like we don't have many since so many were excited to learn about spiders, I have featured the crab spider on three of these photos and then I got a really cute picture of a spider in uh, off the internet. But the crab spiders are from my garden, they're my most favorite and they're the most common. But I want to share that it is um, I believe it's about 70 I think it's about 70% of uh, spiders do not, are not web weavers. So it's a larger uh, percentage of spiders that do not weave webs. Uh, they're actually going to be staying at the base of plants or at the base of a flower, waiting for their prey to come so they can ambush it or jump on it and consume it. So uh, that's why we'll see crab spiders and other garden spiders uh, cruising on the soil or in the case of the crab spider, this guy's hanging out in the flowers. So um, they're really fun. I think they're really neat to check out and I'll share it. They are more afraid of us than we are of them. I know we've always heard that. Um, I personally don't like spiders in my house. I will scoot them out. However, in the garden, I'm always really happy to see them because let me share this. Spiders are the number one most beneficial insect globally. There are spiders on every continent uh, around the world. And if we are to gather up all the food, all the insects, all the food that spiders eat within one year, it would equal the weight of 50 million people. So when I see spiders and I get a little bit like, oof, my tolerance is so much better now. I will see them and I'll say, thank you, friend, and I'll get them outside. Or when I'm in the garden, I'll just like try to make sure I don't get a web on my face come fall. And when I see these little guys, I give them their space because I know they're eating something less desirable. And that's what's so fun. Spiders are pretty amazing. All right. And then what the heck are these? Has anyone heard of beneficial nematodes? You guys can give me a raised hand if you have. Yeah. Okay, cool. So quite a few of us. All right, beneficial nematodes are microscopic worm-like organisms that naturally live in the soil and feed off of other soil dwelling insects, such as lawn grubs, um, cucumber beetle larva, weevil larva, uh, uh, think about anything that's really hard to manage that's like uh, an above ground pest, like a beetle or a weevil. Um, their larva is typically in the soil. So um, leaf miner larva will overwinter in the soil. Let me see what else. Oh yeah, cabbage maggots, uh, flea larva. So outside, if we've got our pets that keep bringing fleas in the house, sometimes we need to inoculate the soils with some beneficial nematodes to take care of the flea larva because they're in the soil. So uh, anyway, there's about three different species that we can purchase on a retail level, typically at our local garden centers. And understand, you want to make sure that the species you're um, buying is going to uh, feed on the pests that we have. But check this out. This is a, uh, in the microscopic, as I said, this is a fungus gnat 
larvae getting attacked by nematodes. So fungus gnats are already small enough as they are. So if we got fungus gnats in our house plants, which is very common, a great way to eradicate them is by getting some beneficial nematodes in that soil. Because so, I mean, it's just so cool. Mother nature is amazing. All right. So here I just like to share, we have our bees and other pollinators. And um, though the honeybee in the corner is not a native, I just like to give a shout out to our native bees. Native bees, we have over 4,000 species of native bees in North America. We have over 1,600 uh, species of native bees in California. And in throughout the Bay Area, we've got about 90. So that's a lot of native bees. Uh, we, these are the two pictures on the top were fun uh, native bees I found in my own garden last year because we were sheltering, sheltering in place. So I got to see uh, a lot more natives and start to learn about the world of native bees a little bit more. That's that euphorbia on the left with that uh, green sweat bee, which is so super cool. Um, I just like to say that 30% of native bees are going to be uh, wood or tunnel nesters. So you think of the carpenter bee, that is our native and he's going to be uh, burrowing into some wood. And then there's other bees that might like, uh, you know, maybe canes from reeds or bamboo, that, that's where they're gonna hang out. They do not create hives. They're just going to be single solo dwellers solitary, just laying their eggs, and then they're going to emerge as after those eggs have hatched. And then there's going to be 70% are ground dwellers. These two on the top happen to be ground nesters. So they're taking advantage of any um, abandoned beetle um, cavities. So beetles that uh, make tunnels and have little cavities in the soil, that's where they're hanging out. So when we talk about using mulch in the garden, which we're really, I've been talking about it so much lately because we're really moving into some dry drought conditions. Mulch is amazing, but we always want to leave an area of the garden raw, uncultivated, and bare, typically around the perennials or some flowering plants. So I will mulch the heck out of my perennial beds, but I'm going to leave some space between my plants, or I'm going to mulch around my plants and leave space beyond. So just get a little strategic and give yourself some room to uh, invite some of our native bees. And so let's now talk about how to attract our beneficial insects. Well, I like to share, what do these flowers have in common? We're gonna look at them, we're gonna say bright colors, yes. And even white is considered a bright color in the garden. And what we're gonna see is that these are flowers that look like daisies or sunflowers. And what we see is a single flower like this aster in my background or a gallardia or a cosmo. Those are actually the petals are rays. That's what a attracts the insects. And that button in the middle, that yellow kind of button is actually hundreds of little minuscule microscopic tiny, tiny flowers. And that's what's really important because so many of our beneficial insects are tiny. So we want to uh, plant a variety of tiny flowers. And then the other side of that is yarrow, sweet alyssum, anything that is uh, like panicles of little flowers that are all clustered together are also also going to be really desirable. So we're going to look at flowers that look like a daisy or a sunflower, and we're also going to look at flowers that grow in clusters. So we again, again, can look at yarrow, alyssum. We're going to look at the dill flowers, parsley flowers, cilantro flowers. We're going to look at origeron, cosmos, asters, and so forth. And trust me, plant them and they will come. You do not necessarily need to buy beneficial insects at your local store. Just plant these flowers, make sure you've got food for them to eat and they will be in your garden. So, so for more information on plants that attract beneficial insects, we have the Healthy Gardens handout on the Our Water Our World website. You can check that out. And we also have an amazing list of plants that attract pollinators and other beneficials on the local UC Master Gardeners website, as well as the California Native Plant Society website. So check out those resources. They are a lot of fun and they're a wealth of information. And beyond our uh, beneficial insects, we have more garden allies like birds. So some of you said you were interested in learning more about birds. So I want to share that birds can eat what is something like 400 or 500 million metric tons of insects 
in a year. So again, doing an amazing service. They, I uh, plant so many flowers just for the birds and those flowers are going to include sunflowers, um, echinacea. I have, uh, uh, I leave berries uh, present like on my hypericum, on my, um, the ground cherry and the ribes so that it tracks the birds. But also what it's doing is that when I've got pests, those birds are coming and eating them. It is amazing. Uh, and then frogs. So we don't really always think about frogs, but I found this little guy in my teepee of string beans a couple years ago. And I was a little worried, but he was in there eating aphids. And beyond that, uh, let me share that they are going to eat fruit flies, mosquitoes, springtails, other flies, moths, slugs, and snails. So frogs are always welcome in my garden. However, I just found two frogs in my worm bin and I was like, all right, you guys are out of there because I know what you're doing. So just want to share, frogs are amazing. And then of course, bats, uh, we are so lucky to live in the Bay Area and we can go out at night, especially if we live closer to uh, a grove of trees or a park or an open space, we will see bats flying around at night. In the Bay Area here, we have um, 25, about 25 species of bats, which is pretty fun throughout California. Um, and check this out, bats are the only mammals that fly. I always like to remember that. But they do an amazing job, uh, gosh, an amazing job at uh, feeding on mosquitoes and moths and other flying nocturnal pests. So I always love to see them, especially when I'm backpacking, it's always a joy. And then our Western fence lizards are definitely a treat. If you're not familiar with this, this is one of the coolest things. A uh, Berkeley scientist found that when ticks feed off of the blood on a Western fence lizard, there is a bacteria that purges Lyme's disease from the tick. Are you aware of that? It is amazing. The Lyme disease is now purged from that tick. So uh, it is a yet to be identified protein in the lizard's blood that destroys the Lyme disease. Um, so that's super cool. I just like to share that with you. So again, these are all our friends doing a lot of work for us. So now let's talk about setting our gardens up for success. We're going to plant a variety of trees, shrubs, and perennials. We're going to offer a water source. And what that means is just having a small glazed saucer that has some pebbles in it, not pebbles you've gathered from the beach because they have a tendency to be uh, salty, but just pebbles from like maybe a creek bed or even from the garden center, they're always washed and tumbled. And I will fill that uh, glazed saucer halfway up with water. And then those pebbles are offering, uh, they're working as a landing pad for my beneficials so they don't drown. And then, then they get to have some water. And trust me, it's not going to be a mosquito vector because that water evaporates out pretty quickly. We're going to let some flowers go to seed. We're not going to deadhead everything because we want the birds to enjoy them. We're going to use that chunky mulch, as I uh, talked about before, to provide shelter for many of the good bugs. But we're also going to leave an area that's going to be natural for our ground nesting bees. And then we want to remember to avoid pesticides. So if we need to go for the pesticides, because sometimes we do, we're always going to use them as a last resort. We're always going to know our pests and only target that pest. If we've got aphids on our roses and we've made sure there's no beneficial insects present and I just got to take care of those aphids with some insecticidal soap. I am only going to spray that rose. I'm not spraying other plants in the garden because those my the only problem is what I'm seeing. Maybe the other plants don't have pests because they've got beneficial insects. We're not using these products as, as preventatives or just because we're a little bit anxious. We're really just going to focus our attention on where the pests are. We are a spot applying, okay? We're always going to use less toxic and eco-friendly. We're going to spray at the end of the day well after sundown. And the reason why I say this is because our beneficial insects, specifically our pollinators, are still out cruising around foraging. And we want to make sure when we apply a pesticide, our beneficial insects, specifically our pollinators, are not present. And so it's really important that we are careful. Um, and then that pesticide has the entire evening to dry. And by morning, it is dry. And what makes eco friendly is eco friendly is they have no residuals that are going to be toxic to our beneficial friends, to us, to our pets, or to our family.
And then we want to avoid spraying trees and shrubs when they're in bloom because that's going to be a little bit uh, vulnerable for our pollinators. And then it's really important to understand the consequences of our actions. And so something I really like to share, it is so important to avoid products that contain neonicotinoids on the label. These are products that act as a systemic they are either going to be used as a soil drench where we're mixing them with water in our watering can and watering around the perimeter of the plant, or they could be sprayed as a topical and then they get absorbed into the cell. These are products that will say uh, all in one feed and kill for 12 months or kills hundreds of pests for you know three months or six months or whatever. Uh, even in this case, one of them is just protects up to six weeks. Yes, it seems very convenient, but I can assure you as a professional gardener for over 25 years, I have never had to use these products. I have worked on very high end estate rose gardens with a lot of success. And if you need some support on how to not use these products, please do not hesitate to reach out to me because these products are extremely toxic to our beneficial insects and our pollinators. So enough of that. Uh, so this is a really cool website. This is on the UCIPM website. This is going to be our B precaution pesticide rating. So get curious. Let's look at our active ingredients on products that we're using, even the eco-friendlies, and let's check out what their toxicity rating is to our beneficial pollinators. And then what I'd like to share is when we do have a pest, we really need to make sure we're identifying it. And it's not always easy. Pest ID is number one. If we can't identify that pest, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. Uh, understanding that life cycle of that pest, understanding that habitat and the timing. And then we also want to understand if there's any beneficial insects present. And I'm just going to go through a couple of examples why it's so hard to identify pests. This is our mealybug destroyer that's uh, feeding on mealybugs, and that's a flea beetle. This is a good bug, that's a bad bug. They're about the same size, and they sure as heck look very similar. And then here we have our cucumber beetle that looks a lot like the mildew-eating ladybug. That's a bad guy. This is a good guy. And then we have our damsel bud, bug, which feeds on a very a wide range of small insects. And this is the leaf-footed bug that is a pest to tomatoes and pomegranates, a good bug, a bad bug. So like I said, it's very challenging. So here are some resources. We have the Our Water Our World website that you can always check out. And then we also have the UCIPM website. If you can identify the plant the pest is on, that's half the battle. Then you're going to go to the UCIPM website, type in that plant, and then all the pests and diseases that can affect that plant will come up. And that's going to help you guide you to your pest problem. I like to share on UCIPM, there's also these really cool quick tips. Uh, these are just kind of fun, the beneficial predators as well as the different ladybug species. So check those out. And then another really awesome resource is bugguide.net. If you've got a picture of a bug that you just cannot identify, take a picture of it, email it to them, and they get back to you pretty quickly. It's usually in about 30 minutes. So I use them quite a bit. It's a lot of fun. And um, it really gets you more excited about the bugs in your garden. And then another really awesome uh, website I'd like to introduce you to is the Nat National Pesticide Information Center. Not only do they have this amazing resource of natural enemies, but they also, you could do a research on um, how the active ingredients of your pesticides work and what the mode of action is, the toxicity levels, um, there's just a lot of information. So I really encourage you to look at, uh, check out this website and learn a little bit more about the products that we're using around the home and garden. So with that, I like to share when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything in the universe. Everything's connected. This is one of my surf and fly friends on my thumb. I was so uh, you know, lucky to have this experience. Thank you all. I hope I've inspired you to get out in your garden and to learn about bugs. And with that, we will finish with your questions. And I just want to thank you all for joining us. Please find me on Instagram and please find Clean Water Program at Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Fantastic, Suzanne. But we have one minute.